Welcome, I'm David Tan, PhD, and for over the past 10 years I've been helping hundreds of thousands of people in over 87 countries attain success, happiness, and fulfillment in life and love. Welcome, guys. I had to give that intro for the video. Um, this is, the talk here is titled, uh, The Secret Scientific Findings About Sex, Love, and the Brain That Society Doesn't Want You to Know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if we'll use this as far as SEO goes, but it was fun to, to use. I gave this talk originally at some universities, so they used this in their posters and it brought lots of students to these things. Um, so um, it gave it as part of some keynotes uh, talks. Okay, so briefly, so why are, we, why, are we why are we talking about this? There are a lot of guys around the world who, there, well, there, there were two particular problems that this talk is addressing. One group of guys uh, falls in love really easily, maybe because it's their first love, or they're innocent guys, they're nice guys with no or very little sexual experience um, and very little relationship experience beyond like lovey-dovey Disney kind of stuff. And then they get their heart broken and they keep get doing, going that, that, in that way. So they're naive guys and they just keep wondering, sort of like you often hear girls wondering, why can't I find love, you know, seeking love and things like that. And then there's another group of guys, which is an offshoot from that group that I'm concerned with. And because one reaction is to give up the naivete and swing the completely other direction, which you see a lot of nowadays. And I can, I'll cite for you the, the red pill subculture, the MGTOW subculture, men go their own way subculture, which is basically saying um, they, they, they have this naivete, this, this Disney fantasy of love, just like every young person does, and then they, they get it, it's, a, it's an illusion, right? So they, they're like, oh shit, this girl, she, she cheated on me, manipulated me, lied to me, or the love, it could have just been as simple as the love faded away, and she left me, and I'm heartbroken. Oh, and that first love for a needy guy um, is one of the most devastating experiences ever, especially if you're, if you're still in your teenage years. So he's like, oh, fuck it. But usually if he's a teenager, he's still going to hold on to the naivete and the hope and, and continue trying again and again. But the guys in their 30s, especially if you've discovered game in your late 20s or later, you don't got that much time to like get into lovey-dovey relationships. Plus the women that you're meeting are gonna be a lot more experienced than you. Um, if you're in your late 20s getting into game, uh, dating women around your age, and they'll be more cynical, a lot more experienced, and what'll happen is guys find out, oh man, she's a slut. <laughs> that girl's dating, man. She, I thought she was pure like my mom, but she was a slut. I thought she was pure like my sister's my mom, but she's a slut. So they go, all. Oh, so if they, after two or three of those, they go, fuck man, all girls are sluts. Be careful of women. The evil feminists, the evil females. And on the face, you can't say that, you know, in polite society, you can't say. And so they go on the internet, you know, the wimps go on the internet. Like real men speak to me in person, the wimps talk to me over the internet. So, so then they go the other way completely and they hate all women, but in a way where they, they love the sex, they love the physical body, but they, they hate what they think that woman is like. And what happens when you prime? You can prime yourself to think things. If you suggest things at the beginning, you prime yourself, you prime relationships, you prime other people. And you, you walk into a relationship or an interaction assuming she's a slut, you're gonna get that negativity, that negative energy coming back at you. Have you been in that situation where you, <laughs> so if you're, where you have been hurt by a woman, or you're in a relationship and you don't understand how to rekindle the passion, you thought all you needed to do was get into that relationship. Once you're in it, you're it's got free. All the hard work is done. Man, getting married, that's the hard work, right? Now I can rest, I'm married, I don't need to work out. I don't need to hang out with my guy friends. I can focus on my career. Right, modern world is like that. Modern dudes, I'm gonna make money now. Cause I got my girl, they put that woman, that wife in on the shelf, right? Like check mark, just got a list of things they gotta do. Six pack, wife, got the wife, right? <laughs> Fuck the six pack now, I got the wife. What's the six pack for, who cares? Give me some beer and donuts, right? And then they can focus on making money. Cause they, uh, they mistakenly think that also will bring them happiness or significance. So then of course the relationship falls apart, they don't know why, and even if you didn't neglect the relationship, even if you did all of, like, the dating stuff and you did what everyone else is doing, you didn't purposely neglect it to pursue money or something like that, it still would fail. And they don't understand why because they don't know the science of it. So 
That's what this talk is about. It's to help you to understand what the science tells us about female psychology in dating and relationships. Female psychology around the issues of, or the topics of sex, of sexual attraction, um, and how to make a relationship work over the long run. The science of it, not the shit that your buddies tell you over beer. <laughs> okay. or, or your female friends tell you over TWG tea or some shit. I don't know if TWG is a reference that will be picked up outside this area. What the science tells us, we're going to be drawing from evolutionary psychology. I'm going to be assuming a lot of knowledge on that, um, as well as the newer fields of neuropsychology and sexology. So neuropsychology is a uh, cross-disciplinary field of neuroscience and psychology. And the uh, offshoot or smaller field of sexology coming out of neuropsychology, the study of the psychology and science of sex. Uh, which is a great, I didn't know that that was an option when I started school because, man, I would have picked the wrong major, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, practical implications and applications, of course, all along the way of each of these. So let's dive into it. Got quite a lot to cover here. Um, the modern dilemma of love. I'm just, these images, I randomly Google stuff that the slide's about to find images to keep your attention. So, but not, they're not all like that, but this one is. The modern, this is the 50 year birthday of Singapore. It's a cake. <laughs> Okay, the modern dilemma of love, women and men, especially women who want their cake and eat it too. In other words, women who want to have the lovey-dovey uh, Hollywood, Disney romance of the long, like uh, right off into the sunset with Prince Charming like life, but then they want to fuck a lot of hot dudes and they want to party. They want to go crazy and be wild and they want to experience what it's like to just see the world and be free. Okay, so they want both. They want to be in a monogamous relationship that's loving with kids and a family, white picket fence, and go, uh, riding off in the sunset with Prince Charming, and then they want to have the wild nights with girls of the sex in the city. So that's the modern dilemma of love. And if you've ever experienced that, they're basically, what I've just described, there are two different types of uh, relationships. One is a passionate type of attraction. One where it's wild and crazy and, and lots of fun, free love, you know, and let's, let's just hook up and not think about the consequences or anything like that, and just hook up and have fun. Totally down for that, I've done that. And then the companionate love of, let's ride off into the sunset together and die, you know, live, old, uh, li uh, live together until we are old and die. Okay, so the modern dilemma results in 60% and higher divorce rates because what's happening is people don't realize that it is a dilemma. That they can't make that transition from um, the passionate attraction that they had with that guy um, that was just hot and sexy and trying to transition into um, the long-term Disney love affair. And uh, psychologists explain uh, or chart this out in, in this way. So this is a, this is a very simple chart. Um, I, I think I took this figure 6.2 from Jonathan Haidt's book, Happiness Hypothesis, very highly recommended. So on the x-axis here, you have time, and the y-axis is intensity. The darker um, uh, line is companionate attraction, or companionate love. And then this dotted line, which spikes up immediately and then quickly dives down, is passionate attraction and never goes back up. So this is the common view of the interaction between these two types of attraction uh, over time in, in uh, clinical psychology. And I think actually that that, you see how that uh, companion attraction line flatlines and plateaus there. I don't think that that's, that's necessarily the case. It can go, continue to go up. But it's a gentle slope, or it's a gentle curve up. Um, and the tricky part is most people just get into a passionate uh, relationship in the, you know, the modern world in um, modern, like with modern, modern Western, and I would have to classify Singapore under the term of Western, especially, you know, Zook having their big thing to not, I mean, like the first club I went to here in Singapore is Zook, and it was like, everyone's telling me, oh, it's so conservative. I go in there, I see people making out everywhere. I see like hookups happen. I'm like, this shit ain't conservative, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like saying KL is conservative. KL is conservative, except in Zook, you know what I mean? It's like, all right, there's a lot of people doing some nasty. So what happens is it goes down, they're trying to transition to make the long-term relationship work, and they never make that transition, okay? And they just experience this. And they're like, oh, this sucks, this sucks, break up. And um, I'm going to get into why that's so. And one of the reasons why that's so is because of the change in global life expectancy. Thank you very much for technology and science has helped us to live longer, more miserable lives. So what happened was this, this line should be sort of like this, 20 to 30. So this is expectancy. Expectancy is different from span. Um, I've, you know, I'm a, a student of history. 
uh, my PhD was in eighth century um, Chinese uh, religious philosophy and psychology. Back then, even, uh, there were Chinese scholars who lived till the 70s. Uh, there are quite a few elites who could live that long because um, they led a life of relative uh, luxury and ease. Um, but the average person succumbed to disease or hunger or whatever it was, or they got killed or eaten or something like that, right? So the expectancy was quite low. And even up until, right up until World War II, expectancy was still low, okay? Because it was called a world war. All right, then uh, I think life expectancy in Asia was still pretty low until the 70s, because we still had the Korean War and there's a lot of war going on in Asia Pacific. So that, that um, spike up is relatively recent. And then with the technolo technological advances, you see it go a lot higher. One of the biggest ones was anesthetic. Um, anesthesia, and uh, the understanding around germs and bacteria. <laughs> so, you know, people, don't know, people thought beer was the, the drink of the gods. I still think it is. But partly they think it, it, it was because you could drink it and not die. Whereas if you drank the water, you would die because all the shit in the water because they boiled the water to make the beer. It's an interesting thing. So the best, some of the best beers made in Belgium by, like from the 1400s, the recipe made by monks, right? Because it was like the, the one drink you could have and not die. <laughs> Um, it was a pretty good time back then. I think everyone was drunk like fuck back then. You know, like, oh, I need some water. Give me some beer. Uh, I wonder if they were giving babies beer. You know, like, just like, because it's the only safe drink. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, and here's another reason. There is this Hollywood under... Or, I mean, not, this is not Hollywood anymore. Um, this is uh, Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. When I was going through high school, this is the version we watched. You probably watched the Leonardo DiCaprio version. This is the one we watched. And uh, in, in, actually, uh, there's a great uh, quotation in Jonathan Haidt's book, Happiness Hypothesis, to explain why we hold on to this notion of love, not just women. That's the most common caricature. Women always want to fall in love. And, but men, too. Every man starts out believing in love because it's natural and it's normal and it's good. But along the way, they get taught random shit, like toughen up, and all this, like, or they get hurt, like I was saying at the beginning, they become bitter and they go to the red pill. And, um, but, but underlying all of that is still this need to find love. And one of the things that I'm gonna be doing in this talk is speaking to two different groups. I will sort of be talking to the red pill people along the way, but the, when I designed the talk, it was originally for all the naive motherfuckers in Asia. Because the red pill ain't in Asia. You know what I mean? So the naive guys who still like, they're 30 years old in their first relationship, I know is crazy, right? I work with a lot of 40 year old virgins. Okay, so um, they, they're, it's their first relationship and they are looking for to create that love relationship that they watch in the movies. Why can't I have that? I worked so hard at math. I deserve love. <laughs> well, they don't actually think they deserve it, but they want it. And, um, so I'm going to just read out this quotation. It's great. The troubadours did give us a particular myth of true love. True love, okay? The idea that real love burns brightly and passionately, and then it just keeps on burning until death, and then it just keeps on burning after death as the lovers are reunited in heaven. This myth seems to have grown and diffused in modern times into a set of interrelated ideas about love and marriage. As I see it, the modern myth of true love involves these beliefs. One. True love is passionate love that never fades. Two, if you are in true love, you should marry that person. Three, if love ends, you should leave that person because then it was not true love. Four, and if you can find the right person, you will have true love forever. <laughs> you might not believe this myth yourself, particularly if you are older than 30, but many young people are raised on it and it acts as an ideal that they unconsciously carry with them, even if they scoff at it. But if true love is defined as eternal passion, it is biologically impossible. Quotation from, from Haidt's book, Happiness Hypothesis. So this idea of passion being required for true love as a marker, as a symbol, as, as the symptom or the sign uh, that it is necessary and sufficient for true love is what causes this dilemma. Not being able to see clearly how companionate attraction is different from passionate. Here's a great illustration of that. Arranged marriages. Randomly found an Indian arranged marriage here. Well, I typed in arranged marriage. I have no idea if this is arranged or not. Um, but the, there was a study in 2012, Cal State study, and other studies um, around arranged marriages. And this particular study uh, looked at couples who are in arranged marriages residing in the US and found that their uh, happiness 
or subjective well-being, right, their reported happiness, was the same or higher than couples who were in love marriages. Right. And guess what? Throughout human history, our ancestors were a product of this. Well, I shouldn't point at this particular photo, but a product of arranged marriages. Because back then, back then meaning before the 1900s, and before, so before the 1900s definitely, um, marriage was uh, what, uh, it was basically an alliance of families. It was what you did when you came of age and had to procreate. So you do that within certain uh, social structures. Um, it was not about love. That's why actually, going back to this, Romeo and Juliet at that time was so scandalous, not because of what we, th we now modern people, we read it in high school as like, oh, a story of true love. A couple so in love, they said, fuck you to the world, and died together. Actually, they died really stupidly, right? So Shakespeare, this is, a, a, this is like a warning. Don't be doing this shit, you dumbass people. It's okay to go fuck around when you're a teenager, but when it's time to get married, you go and find, get married with the people that your parents, with the guy that your parents set you up with, right? So stop fucking around. You can fuck around when you're a teenager, but now you're an adult. You gotta make some babies for us. So these two said, fuck you to all them, and then they died really stupidly. It's a warning, man. <laughs> but we look at it like, wow, that's so romantic. I want that. I wanna, die. I wanna kill myself thinking he's dead, but he's really alive, so he kills himself too. Like dumbass teenagers, right? But that's the history. We've totally looked at it from a different perspective now. Now we valorize that shit. So the history actually goes, and you should know this from science. If you've read any behavioral economics or any social psychology, you know about the adaptation principle. You know that once your brain says, oh well, these conditions are not changeable, you fucking start to adjust. If you're the average person, you will adjust. In fact, even if the conditions are really good, you adjust down. So if you win a lottery, all of a sudden you come up with all this money, six months later, you spend all that shit. <laughs> you might be even more miserable than you started. But you will go back to baseline. And if you were originally really happy, like that brilliant movie, uh, the Italian one, Life is Beautiful, and then, and then some really bad shit happens, like you become quadriplegic, or like in the movie, the Nazis roll in and start killing everybody, you go back after a while to your baseline happiness as well, you go up. The adaptation principle says whatever conditions we have, we start to adapt as human beings. That's just a normal thing. When you say, well, I'm getting married to that girl or that guy, I guess there's nothing I can do about it, eh, you start to look for ways to make it right, to make it happen. If you were miserable at the beginning, you'd have a fucking miserable relationship, yes. But if you were happy due to the beginning, you'd find ways to make it happen. You'd find the positive. So it's still about you. It's got nothing to do with the actual marriage. The amazing thing is we go through so much turmoil now because we have to choose, <laughs> right? This is an interesting thing, it's the paradox of choice, right? <laughs> now we have all these options, Tinder. Woo, uh, which one do I fuck tonight, right? So, okay, so um, now we're fucked. Now we're like, oh, we can't settle. We take that one, then we go, oh, look at that one. Ooh, maybe that one's better. And you put down that donut and you try the other donut. You're in a buffet that never ends. You just keep walking and that buffet keeps going. And you're like, when do I stop? When do I go back to my table? I, I don't know. <laughs> right? Whereas before they gave you, you sat down, they served you something and you got no choice. It's like you're in the mess hall of, of the jail or whatever. You go, okay, I gotta eat this. And you do, just move on with your life. So another example in this context, this is China. <laughs> All right, so it's the same thing all the way through, arranged marriages. Often you'd even see who you're gonna marry until your marriage day, wedding day, I mean. So now we move to love, because it's all about love, right? We gotta get back to love. So my point about the arranged marriages is what happens first is they get into the relationship and then they create love. We're trying to do the opposite. We think we're looking for true love, right? We're seeking love. And how do we know when we got it? Oh, when there's passion. When the passion fades, oh, I guess it wasn't love. Oh, I guess I fucked that. I, I picked wrongly. I saw wrongly. Instead of realizing that love comes and goes, love is controllable. Love is something you can use, that you can give to yourself, that you can um, ma manipulate and control for your own, uh, within your own control, right? So that you can use it when you need it. Sometimes there are different, you have to understand the different nuances of love. So, in uh, the ancient tradition of Greek philosophy, there are three types of love, eros, philia, and agape. Um, hopefully you know what those mean. Eros is like a lust, um, a passionate, intense desire. That's what most young people confuse with being all of love. But then I remind them, hey, you know, your mom loves you. I hope she doesn't want to fuck you. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, yeah, there's other kinds of love. Yes, we use that English word in very capacious ways. So there's philia. 
Philia is brotherly love, right? Phileo, whatever, right? Like between brothers. Um, friends. And then there's agape, self-sacrificial love. So this is a, the, 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 what's the word? The, um, par what's, um, the, the best view of this is the uh, self-sacrificial love of Christ for his people. Right? Christ for his people. So um, agape is, uh, it could also be like the, if you love your child so much, you would sacrifice your life to save theirs. That would be a kind of agape. On top of that, Christian theology um, and Christian philosophy added uh, another big category called storge, affection. Affection. So the affection that you have, you can, well, I think just translating as affection um, helps you understand what that means. Okay. Just realized those lights down the middle are off. Don't know why. Let's get some light here. Okay, Storke. So, um, C.S. Lewis has some other, uh, another way of uh, parsing love, but I'm going to actually, I'm going to skip that. Eros, Venus. So, what's important for you guys to understand is the difference between Eros, this passionate, intense desire, and Venus, which is this raw sexuality. A lot of young people are confused by those two, Eros and Venus, and they, they conflate them. Uh, so, you know, you can have the raw sexuality of it without being in love. I think guys understand that a little bit easier than women. But most importantly, when you see that there are many different kinds of love, that Eros in and of itself, if you just had a relationship that was just passion, then there's not really the kind of love, there's, there's not the love that will sustain a long-term relationship. Passionate, intense desire comes and goes. Especially after you orgasm and it's over, right? And you just want to clean up. You know. <laughs> it's done. It's, you come and go, right? It's done, right? So if you're just depending on that shit to pull you through, scientifically, philosophically, you know, humanistically, it is over. That's not love. That's just one kind of love. That's just one part of love. A relationship has all, a successful relationship requires all four kinds of love. It requires the eros. And that's the one that often goes away over time. But it also requires a friendship, a friendship love. It requires self-sacrificial love, where you put the needs of your partner above your own. And I know all those red pill guys, I'm going to speak to them now, are like, fuck that, just care about yourself. Just take care of number one. And as long as she take care, takes care of your number one, you're good. Well, that's a horrible relationship. That's called slavery, right? Or like indentured servitude. So you... In a, a loving relationship over time, uh, both parties will place the other party's needs above their own um, and in, at times, right? And that's just an important part of it. And if it's, a, if it's mutual, then everyone's taken care of. You take care of yourself, uh, of course, to stay attractive, but you put her needs ahead of yours as well. She puts your needs ahead of hers, and you got a great relationship. Um, but you got to be very, very careful who you get into love relationships with. This is a, like a lot of these, all of these red pill guys that got into relationships with the wrong woman. 90% or more of success in long-term relationships is selection. It's like hiring for your company. 90% of success in that is just, did you pick the right person? All right, so it's a selection. Uh, I made the, it's a hubristic thing that guys who get into game think they can do everything. Because, you know, the sales letter is all about get any woman, anytime, anywhere. Learn this, the four questions to get any, into any girl's pants which I will reveal to you after you look at this goldfish. You know, right? So like, they say, but start believing this, and then they go into the clubs, and because the clubs are very selective, selected type of women, <clears throat> they get responses from those low, low self-esteem women, or those women that they don't even understand are low self-esteem, and they start thinking, oh, I can do this on every woman. And then the, those women start to all turn out like sluts, right, and everything. And then they're like, oh, fuck them all. Well, you had the wrong uh, sample size. You had the wrong sample. Um, and you gave it to the wrong person. Selection is everything. Um, so I did another, I did a, a free course in the Man Up Primer on issue relationship material, uh, where I go over um, the, what a lot of guys think are required uh, for having a happy relationship, like, oh, she likes video games too, or she likes beer. None of that shit matters, really. Um, it's good to have commonalities, but what really matters, I cover in the free video course. So make sure you watch that if, uh, before you watch this, actually, um, to, to know what selection is all about. Because you have to choose the right person before you apply um, your love 
to them um, before you open up. And then one other thing I want to say about love before we move to the next slide is that love, if you, so you understand it, oh, and one other thing is love is storge, affection. And the worst is when passion goes away, so now I'm going back to the naive guys. Passion goes away and what are you left with? A friend that you have affection for that you feel really guilty about leaving. <laughs> and that's what most long-term relationships end up becoming. They're missing Eros. But Eros is just one component, okay? So if you, once you understand this, you see that love is an action, it's not just a feeling. So many of these guys, like the, the ones I was, the, uh, the myth that I was referring to earlier was about the troubadour myth. The myth of true love as being just passion, passion and passion only. That's just not tr the case. That can't be the case. And the most canonical um, theories of love, like for instance in the Bible, where the, Jesus enjoins his disciples, to, or everyone, to love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't mean like, oh, there's my neighbor. Oh my God, yeah, <laughs> my neighbor. It's not, tell, it's not saying like, have raw, passionate, intense desire for your neighbor. He's not saying that shit. He's, say, and even not, he's not even saying have affection for your neighbor. He's not even saying have any feelings at all for your neighbor. If you see a homeless crazy man or whatever, and he's, but he's starving, you don't go, oh, poor homeless crazy man. You don't have to. You could. If that's, it's great if you have the feelings, but you don't have to. What he says, when he, what he means is when, you say, when he says love your neighbor as yourself, go and give that motherfucker some food. Treat him in a certain way. Act towards him in a certain way. Behave towards him in a certain way. Love as an action not a feeling. So in a, the only way a long-term relationship can be sustained is when you do it even though you don't feel it. And you know about the power of physiology. When you start to do it, it'll be a biofeedback loop to your brain that says, oh, I guess I'm feeling it now. Have you ever worked your way into love? Yeah, you have. All you gotta do is invest. <laughs> have you ever become needy? Yes, you have. The only, here's the easiest way to become needy towards anyone. Give them lots and lots of stuff without, without receiving anything from them or asking anything from them. Have it completely one-sided. You will be attached. Here's another way. Go to the, Marine, uh, the MBS casino. Put down $1,000 in every hand. Okay. Will you feel needy towards the outcome of that game? You Obviously, right? <laughs> An easy way to, to actually create the feeling of love, attachment, what modern people mistakenly consider to be all that love is. Oh, I need her so much. I miss her. Just invest. Just fucking over invest. It's so easy. And what Christ was saying, the Christ figure, when he says that love, love your neighbor, is to treat your neighbor, like this is the example of the, the Samaritan, right? Is to behave towards your neighbor in a loving way. So that's when love comes apart from just the feeling. Love is primarily defined as behavior. So it's one thing to say, oh, I love him, I love him, I love him, but I'm going to go fuck all these other guys and I'm going to do all this other stuff. She don't fucking love you. <laughs> She's confused. <laughs> right? So now we move into neediness. Why do we need love so badly? Why? Why do we seek love so much from our parents? Why? Why do we seek love from women? Why do we even need this thing called love? Why do we need it? We just assume that it's a good thing. Why? There are a lot of red pill dudes who are like, well, fuck that love. I'm going to be a man in my, of myself. I'm going to work out. I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to live like Dan fucking Bulzerian. And I will die like that. Right? That's all. They, they don't fucking care. They don't need love. I'll tell you what, though. They do. And it's sad. Now, sometimes right now, it's just like an alcoholic on his binge. He don't need it right then. He's having a great time. He's, he's high on the alcohol. It's good. But when he hits that bend, when, when he comes off the bender and he hits that wall, next morning, he will feel like shit. And he will feel guilty on top of feeling like shit. And all the other fe bad feelings. And then he'll have to, to comfort himself, he'll have to drink again. <clears throat> and that's what I see of the guys who deny this aspect of themselves without understanding it. It all starts when we were babies. And I'm have, I need to go through this a lot quicker than I would like, because um, I'm trying to keep this down to like an hour. But um, we're needy as babies. And I've explained this to you guys in the room already yesterday, um, about when you come out of the womb, you're completely defenseless. You actually have real needs. Those are real, objective needs that you need to have, that you need, uh, or you will die. And 
our baby selves understand that if we're not held, if we don't get that love, we will physically die. So we, it's important that you, as a baby, get that love. And what will happen is when you're a baby, you are lovable. You know, you can, like, people like you, uh, you can shit and people are like, oh, shoot, we got to clean you up. When you cry, they're like, oh, what's, what's he crying about? What is it? Is he hungry? Does he need to have a diaper change? Um, does he just need to be cuddled? What is it? And they're like, oh, what is it? And they try to figure out what you need. And then you get older, right? And then even when you start to learn your first words, it's still cute, right? Then you say, like, cup. And I'm like, oh, my God, he said cup. Yeah, right? And people clap when you pee. This is such a great world. I wish they did that in Singapore, right? Instead of having to do a PSLE. Yeah, just, I, I peed, oh yeah! Imagine that world, but that world stopped. That world was awesome and it ended. And you had no therapy, no coaching, and no support to get through that. And instead, you got, boom! The cold, hard reality of no longer being an infant. Now, you saying cup in itself isn't so cool. You peeing on the ground is not something we just clean up. Right? You go shit on somebody, they don't thank you for it. <laughs> they don't think it's cute anymore. But it's under, important to understand that being needy is natural, but what happened was you didn't grow out of being needy. You just found different, you had, to you had to find different ways of meeting those needs. So now you panicked. Little Johnny, two years old, is like, ah, trying to fake cry to find out whether mommy will come and meet his needs and pick him up and all that. Carry, carry, nope. Oh fuck, right? Testing the boundaries of the self. Where is, where, what is in my control? Shit, these humongous things. These, these parents, these humongous people with arms and legs and a boob that sometimes I can suckle. Uh, is not within my control anymore. It used to be. It was just to be a delay of time. How long will it be till I get that boob? You know, wow, well, wow, well, there it is. Just comes out of nowhere. Woo. And now it's like, oh shit, that thing has a mind of its own that boob. I can't just command it and it comes <laughs> into my mouth. Now I have to do stuff. What do I have to do? So this is when we as infants between 15 to 36 months found coping strategies and we probably tried a lot of different ones but we settled on a particular uh, strategy that worked for us and our parents. Right? So our parents or whoever your primary caregivers were. And for many of my clients and for myself we settled on the achiever or the pleaser. Other ones are like the rebel, um, there's the joker, uh, there's the recluse who just hides, withdraws, often from physical type of abuse. But the achiever and pleaser is the one who's like, okay, they're not so impressed by me saying cup anymore, okay, I'll read a whole book now and show mommy I can do this. I'll show mommy I can do my math. I can show mommy that and if I can do my math, I can do my multiplication tables, then they will love me and cuddle me and give me what I want, the love and affection and approval that I need. But the Asian families, they fucked you over, man. They never told you you were a good son. They never told you that. They would say that maybe once every five years at best. And they probably didn't give you much physical affection. That's starting to change as the world becomes more multi, or like, uh, what's the word? Not multinational, it's um, globalized, right? Globalization basically just means westernization, except for, good, except for food. Everyone loves Asian food. <laughs> All right, so coping strategies of achiever and a pleaser, that leads into fixer behavior. So when a, an achiever or a pleaser gets into a love relationship, what he mistakenly thinks is love relationship, or what he perceives as a love relationship, he becomes the fixer because that's the only way, that's the primary way that he has learned since he was two, three years old to get love. His relationship, his role in the love relationship is the achiever and pleaser. In other words, in the two-way relationship, he is the fixer. He's the one who comes and makes everything right. The fixer then, the good guy, will be automatically attracted to someone who inside needs fixing. So he can feel like the white knight. This is deep ass shit. I'm not going to be able to go into it in detail here. I go into it in detail in our most advanced course called Awakenings. Um, and I do that every week, hop on a live, call, live show and work with these guys live. And I go into that in a lot of detail. But um, it's important just to understand that dynamic of taking on the achiever, pleaser, coping strategy which results in fixer, uh, a fixer role in your relationships. Your white knight role, uh, where you come and try to save her. That you, <clears throat> also as Disney and Hollywood and fairy tale romances give us, about the, the man earning the love of the maiden in the tower. He has to kill everything in the way, slay the dragon, kill the ogre, climb the tower, and then find her, finally win her, sleeping. Fucking bitch was sleeping the whole time. 
I was destroying half their planet for her, and she's just sleeping. See, it's sort of like when dudes, like, <clears throat> they do all the, they have horrible dates, by the way. So we've got a whole, whole other course called the Perfect Date System. But one of the reasons why guys need that so bad is because most guys approach dates like, like Prince, the, the, like they're the knight in shining armor, right? They approach their relationships that way. They approach their dates that way. So the girl, all she's got to do is show up and look pretty. She just has to show up, look presentable. Everything else, fuck, it's the dude's. It's a dude's thing, man. He's got to pay for the dinner. He's got to organize this. He's got to organize that. He's got to plan this, plan that. He's got to do it all. Like this, that's how fucked up the modern world is. And yet the women also want their cake and eat it too. They want also to have the independence and respect. Don't open my, don't hold the door for me. What do you think? I can't hold the door for myself, right? They want to be able to do that. They want to take the man's role in society and life, but then they want to be treated as the defenseless, uh, no money women. So as men, you gotta put your foot down. You want equality, then we're gonna have equality. If you wanna be a dependent, then we can do the whole thing where you just show up and look pretty. All right. But if you want equality, then let's be equal here. I, let me show up and look pretty. And there's no reason why not. All right. Just show up and look pretty. And then be spontaneous and have fun. But go with the perfect date system, it's even better, guaranteed. Kabloom, what, is that a word, kabloom? Where did I hear that from, some stupid ass TV show? All right, and when I tell guys what I'm about to tell you now, <clears throat> The first reaction is, not the red pill guys, they're, always, they're all going to be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, right? But like the average dude, uh, who's also with relatively little experience with sex and relationships, the average dude is going to be like, okay, yeah, I see that, I see that, but not my girlfriend. Okay, I see that, I see that, but not the girl that I want. Yeah, I see that, but not the girl in class that I have a crush on. She's not like that. They'll always go for the exceptionalism. And it's that kind of denial is, reminds me of like, there's this kid in my school way back, like grade two or whatever. He continued to believe in Santa Claus. You know, and there's this other girl who believed in the tooth fairy. She insisted that it existed. And all of us were like, there's no Santa Claus, come on. Come on. And the teacher would get really mad at us. Don't tell her there's no Santa Claus. You know, but like, we're all looking at her like, you're so stupid, right? And, and in a way, we're like that around relationships and love and women. And I'm trying to, trying to like tell you the truth. And it's not like we're taking them off the pedestal and saying they're dirty and nasty and evil, right? That's the red pill mistake. But I'm saying they're as dirty, nasty, and evil as you. Okay? You have to accept that. You have to, that's it. That's all. And yet there's a redeemable part of you, I hope. Not all of you, but some of you. Okay? <laughs> Just like for women. There's a redeemable part of you. And what we have been living through is sort of like, same with the red pill guys and the naive guys, is it's like, I'm about to turn on the lights. I'm about to tell you, actually, I'm about to tell you that there's nothing to be afraid of in the dark. I'm going to turn the lights on and show you there's nothing to be afraid of in the dark. And then I'm going to turn the lights off again and we're going to get back into reality. But what most kids, so sort of like what most guys have done is that they have, instead of growing out of their fear of the dark, they continue to be afraid of the dark, but they keep the lights on. And they just make enough money that they can keep the lights on 24-7. They don't have to, so that they don't have to deal with their fear of the dark. I'm now going to show you, I'm going to pull back the veil and show you what's the, the, the dark side of women. But then also show you there's nothing to fear about it. it was, actually, this is quite timely. In the Man Up group recently, somebody posted um, a quote from one of the books I, I actually will be citing here. And it says, if that's true, then how can I not feel insecure as a man? I said, please elaborate. I'm not sure what you mean. He elaborated. Basically, he was just like, if that's true, then I'm doomed. If that's true, there's no loyalty. If that's true, there's no love. If that's true, it's over. Ah! Right? And it's just like a guy who just learned there's no Santa Claus. It's okay. Someone else will bring you presents. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to pull back the veil, reveal that there's nothing to be afraid of. But first, let's explore the dark side. Why do you continue to have this belief that women are pure paragons of virtue who don't have sexual desires and aren't as nasty as you? Why don't you believe, why do you still, why do you still resist this? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you had a good mother. I had a good mother. And when you think about like the difference between a guy who becomes the very few men in the world who as a teenager discovers that women are, you know, a little wild, dark, nasty, right? And he takes advantage of that because you're a teenager going through puberty, you will. Um, versus us, normal guys, it's all about your mama. It's all about your mama. So let me give you, uh, as an example, the life of Iceberg Slim. If you haven't seen this book, you haven't read it, um, I, I advise you to pick it up. It's, if you're not uh, American, 
it can be tough to get through because it's written in a very colloquial slang. Even I had a hard time going through it, um, but it was entertaining, definitely. Uh, and basically, I'm going to give you the beginning of the story. And this is a real life pimp. Okay, there's documentaries on him and all that. Um, his original, his real name is Robert Beck. So Robert Beck and his mother, when they were, when he was growing up, they were poor, penniless. He says. And then there was this upstanding beta male business leader named Henry Upshaw. And just for the guys on the tape, because you guys don't need to know this because I've been reinforcing it so often, but there is nothing wrong with being an upstanding beta male. The world needs more upstanding beta males. It, from a scientific perspective, the only thing that distinguishes an alpha male and a beta male is mating opportunities. But you know what? A lot of these so-called alpha males, they're using condoms. You know, so they're not having more babies. Right? What good is it if you are Wolverine, but you're not fucking? You're not passing on your mutant gene, right? So as far as you're, you're just tricking your fucking DNA. Meanwhile, upstanding beta male has five kids. He wins, right? Every one of you guys who have kids has already beaten me, even though I fucked hundreds of women. You win. Your DNA has been passed on. Mine yet has not. Maybe later when you watch this video, a few years later. But right now, it is not. So you win, motherfuckers. And all these guys are like, I'm the pimp. I fucked so many girls. You already lost from an evolutionary perspective. You care so much about evolution. Like some of the guys are like, oh, evolution says I got to do this, so I got to be this way. Well, you suck because you're not doing any of that shit for real. You're not having 20 kids, 50 kids. You know who won? Osama bin Laden's dad. That's really sad to say. But Osama bin Laden's dad had like tons of wives, and he had 50 kids. Osama bin Laden was the seventh child of his mother. Who was looking for significance there, right? <laughs> but that motherfucker won, right? You, all with your Harvard degree or whatever fuck shit, you aren't have any babies yet. You lost so far. So fuck this evolution shit. It's perfectly fine to be an upstanding beta male. You can have happiness, fulfillment, and you can actually beat the so-called alpha male now because of fucking birth control threw off all of human evolution, right? So now actually in Singapore too, right? I'm going to say this on the tape. I don't fucking care because Lee Kuan Yew said this. Who's winning the evolutionary game here? Not the educated people. Not the people Lee Kuan Yew wants to win the evolutionary game. They're all using birth control and delaying having babies. Who's fucking winning? You don't have to say. You all know. And he's like, we can't have that happen. We can't have that. We need to get our master's degree females have popping babies out. So let's give them some money to pop babies out. Of course, the people who are popping babies out already, they're going to take advantage of those baby bonuses too. Right, so it's still, there's an imbalance, right? Look at that. Fucking birth control threw off all, all of evolutionary history. You fast forward in human history 10,000 years, uh, well, 100,000 years from now, it'll be very different from what you would predict because the people who have real advantages, the ones who create great systems like Google and Facebook, they're not having that many kids. The kings, they're not having that many children anymore. When you were the king of China, the emperor of China, whatever, king of Egypt, you had harems and you popped out a shitload of babies. And then all of these other guys in, who were soldiers, they all died. <laughs> you know, it was more like a, a guerrilla um, type of society. Right? One guy fucks all the women, the other guys just all are there to defend that shit. <clears throat> and that's not the case anymore. There is nothing wrong in the modern world with being an upstanding beta male. And if you make enough money as an upstanding beta male, because many upstanding beta males will put their head down and do the work, They'll make it through middle management and they'll make it to VP of marketing. Right? They'll make it to VP. And what'll happen is, as a VP, they're making decent money, right? So they can go in a, if they just need to fuck, they can just go and pay for it. Because physically speaking and mentally speaking, it's the fucking same. They win. Alpha male lost. This is the most equal, equalized opportunity for beta males ever in the history of mankind. Be a beta male, it's easier. <laughs> Okay. So, Henry Upshaw, upstanding beta male. If I met him, I'd shake his hand, I'd give him money, I'd love this man, just based on what he said here. Iceberg Slim loved him. When he was like 10 years old, this uh, Henry Upshaw took him under his wing, loved him, and looked up to him. <clears throat> However, his mother cheated on Henry, cheated on Henry Upshaw with a pimp. <clears throat> she lied to Henry Upshaw. So, Henry, basically, what Henry Upshaw, I'm going to skip this section. I used to read this, so I did a mastermind talk uh, years ago, a uh, year and a half ago where I did a lot more detail on this. But basically what happened was Henry Upshaw whisked them away from their poverty, put them up in a beautiful home, um, and ferried them around in his car. And uh, at church, they were like the, the talk of the town that like everyone was like, oh, wow, they're so awesome. So he was fulfilling her need for significance. This is when Henry Upshaw really should have watched my free course 
on issue relationship material. This would have saved him all of the problems. But he didn't know that because you know he was upstanding beta male. He didn't understand women. Now you will, so you will avoid his his mistake. <clears throat> so anyway, um, he so she cheated on him and then left Henry Upshaw and he eventually died like a year later from heartache. Now this is a quotation from uh, Iceberg Slim. <clears throat> Even I, a 10-year-old, knew that this huge, ugly black man who had rescued Mama and me from actual starvation back in Indianapolis loved us with all of his great, sensitive heart. I loved Henry with all my heart. <clears throat> he was the only father I'd ever really known. He could have saved himself an early death from a broken heart if instead of falling so madly in love with Mama, he had run as fast as he could away from her. Yes, poor Henry's, heart, uh, Henry's fears had foundation. Mama had never loved Henry. This kind, wonderful man had only been a tool of convenience. One scene in my life I can never forget, and that was that morning when Mama had finished packing our clothes and Henry lost his inner fight for his pride and dignity. He fell down, down on his knees and bawled like a scalded child, pleading with Mama not to leave him, begging her to stay. He had welded his arms around her legs, his voice hoarse in anguish as he whimpered his love for us. I will never forget her face as cold as an executioner's, which she was as she kicked and struggled loose from him. Then with an awful grin on her face, she lied to his face and said, Henry, honey, I just want to get away for a while. Darling, we'll be back. As the cab drove us away to the secret rendezvous with Steve the Pimp sitting in his old Model T, I looked back at Henry on the porch, his chest heaving, as tears rolled down his tortured face. So then they moved on, uh, Beck and his mom. And they went back to find Beck's biological father, who had by that point made good. He'd made some money, made something of himself, and then she went back to him and they moved in together. And then the pimp, who she was still seeing on the side, convinced her to set up Beck's biological father to rob him of all his possessions. And then uh, when Beck's father came back home, uh, the mother just cried hysterically upon discovering the robbery. And then Beck says this, I know my lousy old man deserved what happened to his goods. I know mama got her revenge and it was sweet, I'm sure. But it was bitter for a kid like me to know that mama was part of it. Perhaps if mama had kept that burglary cross a secret from me, in some tiny way, I might have been stronger to fight off this pimpin' disease. I don't know, but somehow after that cross, mama just didn't seem like the same honest, sweet mama that I'd prayed in church with back in Rockford. And thus is born the ladies' man. <laughs> so uh, there's another interview that's quite interesting. Late in, in his life, long after he left pimping, Robert Iceberg Beck gave an interview reminiscing on his life and career. The interviewer said, do pimps hate their whores? Beck said, well, not necessarily consciously. The best pimps that I've known, that is the career pimps, the ones who could do 20, maybe 30 years as a pimp, were utterly ruthless and brutal without compassion. They certainly had a basic hatred for women. My theory is, and I can't prove it, if I were to use the criteria of utter ruthlessness as a guide, that all of them hated their mothers. Perhaps more accurately, I would say that they've never known love and affection, maternal love and affection. I've known several dozen, in fact, that were dumped into the trash bins when they were, what, only four or five days old? The interviewer said, <clears throat> you say you loved your mother in your book. Beck says, of course. But underneath the threshold of consciousness, I know that I must have hated her, as demonstrated by my neglect of her through the years. So to people like Iceberg Slim, women were demystified to them at an early age, which made them fall out of love with them. Okay. And that did not happen to you. And instead, what happened was, <clears throat> you learned some game. <laughs> and good game. Game that actually fucking works. And the only scientifically verified game is the game of the dark triad. We will later today explore your dark side. But before that, let's explore the dark triad. The dark triad is a handy way of referring to three different psychological problems, we call them, psychological neuroses. All right, narcissism, Machiavellianism, and psychopathy. Briefly, very briefly, because I go into these in much more detail in Awakenings. Narcissism is characterized by grandiosity, pride, egotism, and a lack of empathy. Machiavellianism is basically game playing, right? Machiavelli. Characterized by manipulation, exploitation of others, a cynical disregard for morality, and a focus on self-interest and deception. 
Psychopathy is the scariest one of these three. Psychopaths are actually really dangerous. Psychopathy is characterized by enduring antisocial behavior, impulsivity, selfishness, callousness, and remorselessness. The more of these, so, so the scientific studies show that those who score highly on these, the tests for these three also have much more, many more uh, sexual partners than average. So there's a, very high, there's a very high correlation between scoring highly on dark triad traits and sexual partners for males and females. And then the scientists come back and say, oh, why would this be so? Oh, if you know game, you already know why. It's always on. She wants me. What's that? Grandiosity, pride, egotism. I'm the, no one can hurt me. I, you can't throw me off my frame. My belief is my reality. That's right there. Perfect. I've just made myself into a narcissist. That's why I'm so attractive. Machiavellian. You know what push pull is? You know if she, call, if she texts you at that time, you should text, wait this amount of time and text back. You know what the first thing you should say is? You know how to use your emotions to get her to do stuff. Machiavellian. You're a great game player. Psychopaths. You got to be cold. Ice cold. Right? You can't feel too much. You can't let the weakness happen. Right? You gotta put yourself first. You gotta take care of yourself. You gotta watch your investment. Right? Make sure she invests more than you. So what psychopaths and narcissists do? All of game is like this. Now, you can learn game superficially. Memorize this line, say this, and for a while, maybe for like a, a month or so, it won't be real. And, and in a way, that's when you have shit game. You're just learning to parrot lines, memorizing shit and spitting it back out. But to actually be good at game, you have to internalize it and it changes your personality. You have to take on the personality of an attractive man, sexually attractive man. And at the just purely sexually attractive man, I'm not talking about attractive as in like um, to, to everyone, like, but sexually attractive, the kind of man who women respond to sexually. It's right here. And the better you get at that, the more narcissistic you become, the more of a Machiavellian and psychopath you become. And who does this attract? I didn't plan to go into this, but it attracts female versions of the Dark Triad because the Dark Triad wants challenge. When you get good at game, you want someone to bander back at you. You want a hot girl who's a challenge. Otherwise, it's too easy. It's like sport fishing. You throw it back in the water. You want a challenge. Guess what? Natural Dark Triads. Guys like Slim, who became a Dark Triad when he was a teenager. Female versions of Slim. The really hot girls who started clubbing when they were 14, 15, 16 years old, like in Singapore, where, where the drinking age is 18 and there's lax door policies, right? They will become very quickly dark triads because that's how you get results in the club or in those, in atmosphere, in those environments. And they want a challenge. You meet a 21-year-old female dark triad, she is a fucking veteran. Not in the U.S. because they have like 21-year-old drinking age. So I changed that to 25-year-old woman in the U.S. She's a fucking veteran. Modern women, fucking veteran. You guys are going to be eaten up by, like, by wolves if you go to the club with no experience like that. And you do. You get eaten up. Like I was talking about like, so the big group of naive guys who keep getting fucked over. And then they swing over. America, they got more of the red pill guys. Um, but more around the, the westernized nations, they have red pill guys who are like, well, if this works... And I just keep, they mistake all the women they meet as dark triads. They're like, all women are dark triads. They don't use these terms, of course. They're not self-conscious about this at all. But then they go, they're like, fuck, I want to win that game. I got to win that game against that woman. I got to win that game against that club slut. I'm going to step it up. I'm going to learn even better how to be a dark triad. I'm going to be a dark triad level four. She's a level three. I'm going to move up to level four. It's like, it's like BJJ, you got a purple belt? I'm going to get a black belt on that shit and I'll come back and beat you. And they just keep step, stepping it up on their manipula manipulation. Don't fall into the manosphere trap. That's where the former mama's boy turns into the late bloomer's lady man, ladies man becomes bitter. Now this is another one of those things, there are some statistics that say that 100% of men do not notice that King Kong is in this picture. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> yeah, wait, where? Is it, is it there? Can you see it? <laughs> All right, you probably can't see it because it's so bright, but he's over there. Anyway, don't fall into the manosphere trap. All you guys watching this are going to be like former, they're basically, basically you used to be mama's boys, the opposite of slim. You had a good mom. You didn't walk into her, uh, you know, fucking five guys getting reamed in the face and shit, right? Good. 
Just thinking about that, it's like really gross, right? That means you're a mom's boy. You had a, you didn't, you actually necessarily, unconsciously, put pussy on a pedestal. And one way to, to get that off the pedestal is to go swing completely the other way and, you know, become a dark triad. But it's still fake. You're not doing it for real. You have to actually confront the dark side of women for real. Um, and it's a lot like finding out, when you find out for real, the things I'm going to tell you now, after this slide. It's like finding out there's no Santa Claus when you're 30 instead of 5. Right. If that teacher kept saying, don't tell him there's no Santa Claus, and he, you know, he's like, where's Santa, where's Santa, fuck, there's no Santa anymore, and he's like, there's no Santa? What happens is he develops a bitter chip on his shoulder because he feels cheated and lied to for so long. So long none of you people told me there was no Santa? And that's what happens like you guys, figuring out game when you hit 30. And the difference is the natural ladies' man, the specs, the, the slims of the world who figured it out when they were teenagers, they learn to accept over time the woman's dark nature, their dark triad natures. And then they might have even given them a begrudging acceptance, and they don't dwell on them. He's learned to adjust to their flaws early, and he's even learned to appreciate them. However, the late bloomer former beta male feels lied to for so long and dwells on all the grief and embarrassment and heartache he could have avoided for so long. I'm speaking to you Manosphere guys right now. You red pill. M-T-G-O-W guys. You are late, blo late bloomer former beta males figuring it out now that you're old, older, right? They then obsess over the dark triad nature of women. Sluts, whores, he feels betrayed and then unconsciously develops revenge on the whores. Get them all. And then they compulsively post shit on their Facebook, anti-women shit. Like, they couldn't help themselves. They're obsessed about it. He fe it feeds into a self-righteous sense of betrayal even more, which then motivates him to search out even more evidence. He goes from dividing all women, women into Madonnas and whores, moms of Madonna, my sisters are Madonnas, and all these club sluts, they're all whores. And then, he lump and then as he gets more experience, becomes more bitter, he lumps them all into the whore category. Or he'll say, you know, at least 90% of them are whores. His life becomes a giant exercise of confirmation bias. Don't make that mistake. Keep your eyes open, because they're just as evil as you. If you believe you're redeemable, that slutty girl is redeemable too. And maybe, just maybe, you can find a girl who's, who's opened her eyes to reality. Because what you don't want is a naive one, right? Like a village girl. And you bring the village girl to Singapore, you bring the village girl to New York, and she's like, and she's hot, right? A hot village girl, bring her to New York, she's ruined. Ruined, right? It's like bringing a village boy to the go-go bar. He's ruined. You bring him to Jakarta, it's over. <laughs> he is lost for at least four years. Put some money in his hand, he is done, he's gone. You will not see him. At night, he will always, he have, he's going to have like this, oh, where are you, man? Oh, I don't know, I was at the strip club till 5 a.m. Oh, ho, ho, it was amazing, right? So what you want is a girl who's seen it, but hasn't been ruined yet, just like a girl wants a man who's not fucked the entire village, hopefully, right? but has seen it and isn't tempted by it. Right? That's the best situation. So moving into that, keep your eyes open, because they exist. Those women who are sexual creatures, if you know how to treat them, they will respond to you with loyalty. Because if you meet all of their needs, and she meets your needs, why would, you, why would you go anywhere else? They will only stray when you're not meeting those needs. Now it's important to understand this, and I'm be getting, getting to this in, in the rock solid relationships, um, how to meet the needs. But always with the caveat of choose wisely who, whose needs you meet. Okay, so keeping that as a caveat, let's dive in. Some of you guys here in this room know this. I presented this in various places around the world, in universities and different stages. And I'm still shocked at how few men uh, and a few people know this research, um, but most of you here in this room, this should be review for you. Meredith Shivers in the plasmograph and the fMRI, um, the most famous study. They took women and men, showed them eight different conditions under an fMRI. The plasmograph, uh, by the way, is this thing. It's also what um, the technology used in the Apple Watch to measure your heart rate, that this, these like pulsing green lights, or plasmograph lights. Um, and they basically measure blood flow. What they do is they insert this baby into her vagina and measure blood flow. If there's blood flowing down there more than usual, um, she's aroused. Right? The, the brain scan also tells you arousal. They can see arousal in it as well. And then they also give her a note, like a, a pad, 
a keypad where she indicates whether she's aroused, yes or no. The eight conditions are monkeys mating. I'm not gonna actually have to Bonobos, actually, to be specific. Bonobos fucking. Heterosexual sex. Female, female sex. Male, male sex. A man masturbating. A woman masturbating. A man who is chiseled walking on the beach. A well toned woman doing calisthenics on the beach. Men showed arousal. So that for the men, they didn't use this. <laughs> you don't put it in your ass or something. They use a, a penis pump, right? And so it displaced air if you were aroused. You can just look down. I mean, it's like, it's just pretty obvious, right? <laughs> it's hard for a man to lie. <laughs> but, you know, so they put this in the woman. Now, the men were aroused under two conditions, two conditions only. Straight males were aroused by heterosexual sex and female, female sex. That was it. Um, I was thinking, man, I don't know, well toned women do it. No, okay. But women were aroused by all eight conditions. They were even aroused by mating of monkeys and male male sex just sex in at any in any way just like oh it's sex Woo but what's interesting is the keypad they're saying yes no yes no they're saying no on everything except female female and male uh, female they don't fucking know and this leads to this wonderful video uh, and I just realized I still have the music on I gotta but I'll play this I'll play this video because it's so short and fun um, and it says Every time I ask my girl what she wants to eat, and this is from, what's that movie called? Oh, The Notebook. What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple. What it's do you want? God damn it. What do you what? want? <laughs> Girls don't even know what they want. All right, so that was, that was my only point. That was just fun. All right, so. They don't know what they want. They don't know what turns them on. They don't know. So if you just straight up ask them, what do you want in this relationship? Don't just, you gotta listen to what she says. If she's older, especially, if she's very self-aware, she can actually really straight up tell you. But most women are not even in tune with their bodies. And in fact, there are, there are theories to try to explain the, sub, the confounding, why that would be the disconnect. And it's a very simple one, simply that it's easier to lie when you believe the lie. All right. So if, if the man says, did you fuck that, did you turn on by that other male? She's like, no. He's going to be like, well, let me check. You know, you know, she's just lying. And she's like, yeah, I'm not, but she is. You know, so, um, I mean, that's a great lie detect. That was a great way to lie, to actually mean it. So here's another example. Female masturbation and porn use. It turned out a study from Ohio State University um, was identical to the males. Female masturbation and porn use was identical in males. And in fact, under certain conditions, so there were three conditions that they did the test on, test under. One was where you knew, you, you made eye contact with the person doing the study, and you knew this person was a classmate. The second condition was confidentiality. This would be complete confidential. We signed the confidentiality agreement on both sides. And then the third was you thought you were getting hooked up to a polygraph test. And then on all three conditions, you are asked the question, how many sexual partners have you had? How often do you use porn? How often do you masturbate? And under all of these, and so on, the males were pretty consistent all the way through. They didn't have anything to hide. Right? Women, oh man, when they thought that they like under the confidence, when they thought that they were under confidentiality, the number of reported sexual partners increased to about the same as the males reported. And then when they thought they were under a polygraph test, it shot way above what males are were. So I'm like, it takes two people to fuck. So either one guy is really doing a lot of work. You know, it's a small guy, and that's probably the case, right? It's always like 3% of the Pareto principle. Or they're fucking like dudes who are not in college. <laughs> um, but under the polygraph conditions, it turns out, holy shit, these college girls, they masturbate, they use porn, they fuck a lot of different dudes as much as your guy friends. And here's another great example, uh, James Dean. <laughs> So James Dean is now uh, charged for, like, for various kinds of things like rape and shit like that. But when I first made these slides, he wasn't. James Dean, even now I would say, is probably the most well-known porn, is the most well-known porn star to females. You probably never heard of him. Um, I don't know, maybe you have. Uh, but the porn stars or the male porn stars usually are um, what guys like to see, like some big dude dominating the girl, right? Big, muscly, steroided dude. Uh, maybe he doesn't use steroids because he's a porn star, so he's got to make sure that shit's working. But, but anyway, he's this big dude, right? And as I was saying earlier, like my pants are really tight. If I knew this wasn't going out, if it's just going out to this video to dudes, I would not be wearing slim jeans, skinny jeans. I would be wearing, you know, like the 
do jeans, right? Because what guys think look good, what girls like, what girls think, oh, that looks good. If a guy thinks, oh, that looks good, he's like a girl. It's like, it's like gay, right? So, um, good fashion that turns women on um, will often turn men off. And the same with the, like the, the sex stars here. So, the male porn star that g uh, girls like. Um, guys just generally, uh, you know, you would think, oh, this guy's a porn star, what's so special about him? And that's part of what's special about him. He's like the, g the guy next door um, kind of look, right? And I've heard from the research, um, there's like GQ uh, feature articles on him, there's all these interviews with him, he has his own uh, websites and stuff, that girls really like his facial expressions <laughs> and his sincerity. In other words, his believability, man, believability. So, Another study by Wallen and Rupp showed that women were as aroused during porn viewing as men were. And now we have all the devices to measure arousal. So women like that shit. They just like to look at different shit. But it's still porn. Right? It's not like the soft core, like nothing. They like that nasty shit, man. Like, they like to see it. They like to see vagina. <laughs> Here's some more evidence for that. Uh, so on the view, on the, the perspective that um, women are more turned on by emotions and men are more turned on by viewing stuff, right? Men are more visual, women are more feeling. Here's, here's some evidence to show that that's total bullshit. So that one of the, probably the only study that really uh, gave evidence for that old view was um, where they showed men, <clears throat> here's a photo of this beautiful celebrity, would you fuck her, uh, yes or no? And they all said, yeah, I'd fuck her. You know, and then they showed the women, here's a celebrity male, would you fuck him? They're like, oh, no, not really. And they're like, aha, see? Women are turned on by emotions, they have to have a connection to get on, uh, to get aroused. Men just need to see her and they'll fuck her, right? Um, and then they re-ran that study, same conditions but different subjects, obviously in different uh, female stars. So, so this time they used um, Angelina Jolie and they used an old Christy Brinkley. All right, and they asked the men, would you, if no one else found out, would you fuck them? Hey, yeah, hell yeah, yeah, yeah. And now they changed, I forget, I, I should have written down who the old male stars were, but they were not attractive male stars. And this time they swapped out the stars. They gave you Johnny Depp and Brad Pitt, good old Brad, and they said to the girls, if no one else found out, would you fuck Johnny Depp? Would you fuck Brad Pitt? And they're all like, hell yeah, 10 out of 10. Yes, 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 ding, 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 ding. Oh, yes. Here's another example. Uh, another, another example from Shivers, another uh, experiment from Shivers. Women uh, were shown photos of various conditions, and then they used the same things, the plasmograph, the fMRI, and they found out that women were aroused by all four of these photos, the erect penis, the slack penis, the demure vulva, where you just sort of see it like that, and then the spread vulva, okay, four conditions. Under all four conditions they were aroused, but they were most aroused by the erect penis. And now y'all can be sending penis pics. <laughs> okay, they're all aroused by that. Just, just as a thing, the reason why you shouldn't just be sending penis pics as an opener, uh, <laughs> because yeah, she might be aroused, but arousal is different from, from what you're gonna do with it, right? So just like when you see a Krispy Kreme donut, you might be aroused by it, right? Doesn't mean you're gonna give up everything and go and eat it. Um, just to be clear about that. But to say that she's not aroused by it, that's just denial. Right? Just like if a nasty girl, like a girl you don't like at all, she did some evil thing that she killed your mom, and then she sends you a pic of her pussy, you'd be like, oh, you'd be like fucking bitch. <laughs> you know, still pussy. You know, pussy's a pussy. <laughs> all right, here's another example. This is the one that's really going to kill you. Or to kill the naive guys. Uh, well, wait, before I get into the friends, I don't want to go there yet. All right. Another um, experiment that came out of the Stage Lab uh, run by Shivers at Queen's University. So they use a plasmograph, they use a keypad, but then this time they use audio fantasies. Instead of photos, instead of videos, they use audio. And the only thing that they changed in the three conditions were the, um, a few words where it was either the male strain, it was either a stranger or a friend or a longtime lover. And then they changed the genders of each of those. And then they, they gave these audio fantasies to the females and the males. Here's what they found for the females. The females, the women, uh, found the female strangers twice as arousing as female friends. So they ran this fantasy, oh, but if it was a stranger, oh, they want to get down with the female stranger. 
So uh, if you want to get a threesome with your girl and her best friend, it's a lot harder than a cold approach threesome that some girl she's never met. All right? That's how we use research to get what we want. <gasps> yes, that's how you do it. Here's another condition. Here's another finding. Women found male strangers eight times more arousing than male friends. Eight times. Kaboom, man. This is the best evidence for the friend zone. <laughs> eight times. <laughs> You might as well be a stranger to her if you want to get sex. So this is the friend zone couch. Now available. <laughs> so if you're in the friend zone, you're really in damage control. You got to get our free video course, how to get out of the friend zone. And here's the one that may be the most surprising to you. So we find out women are more turned on by female strangers than female friends. They're far more turned on, eight times more, by doing a male stranger than a male friend. So so much for friendship. That don't count for much, for sex, for sexual attraction. Strangers, complete male strangers, were slightly more arousing than longtime lovers. That means you can spend 30 years with this wife and she'll still be slightly more aroused on, you know, on average and by a male stranger who is hot. I throw in the hotness, it can increase. Strangers are slightly more arousing than longtime lovers. Sex with strangers. <laughs> so where is this connection in the old school way of thinking? Between women need emotional connection and only, they need it to have sex. No, they fucking don't. They're like you motherfuckers. You guys driving the red light district traffic. <laughs> I'm going to talk about you specifically, I'm just like for the effect of the video. All right. Women are just as nasty. Here's some more evidence of nasty. The Power of Language and Words and Female Arousal, Fifty Shades of Grey, the best selling book. Oh, I haven't put it up there yet. The best selling book of its time. And in fact, there was a, there was a time when all three of the, the trilogy books were at the top of the list. And this book is only purchased by one half of the population of the world, and yet it beat all the other books. It even beat the Bible. What's, what are we gonna say about that one? <laughs> the Harlequin romance industry before Fifty Shades of Grey was already a $1.5 billion industry in itself. Those stupid books, that you, we, we, actually we don't see them here in Singapore, but if you go to America, they have those throwaway books by the cash register, and they've got like Fabio with his long hair and his arms around her, and she's like, and her, her, you know, her blouse is getting torn away and they're on some ship at sea, and he's like, <gasps> you know, Harlequin Romances, so many women buy those things. This is a real, great example of the same genre, and it beat out all the other books in the world. A study at the University of North Texas found that 30 to 60 percent of women admit to rape fantasies. The authors argue the actual numbers would be higher if they used polygraph for confidentiality conditions. There are various reasons for this. Meston at UT Austin gives the excitation, excitation transfer uh, theory. Chivers uses lubrication under sexual attack theory. I think that's the best one. One thing to say here is that arousal is not consent. I, I mentioned that earlier, but I want to re reiterate that here. It's possible to be aroused by all sorts of things you didn't want in, that you didn't in fact want in real life. All right, arousal is not consent. But they sure, uh, they sure do like that stuff. <laughs> so one other thing, women tell you all the time, I want to make love, I don't, I don't want to fuck, I don't want fucking. That's a fucking lie. They think, she's the average woman, they think that's what you want to hear. They think, if, I, if he thinks I'm not a slut, then he'll love me more, he'll stay with me. And in the meantime, in their minds, they got nasty fantasies going on, just like you guys, when you're fucking your girlfriend for the fifth year and you're thinking about that porn you looked at the other day, I know. <laughs> Women are the same. So just drop all that fake bullshit and just go for real, all right? Learn how to have the dominant sex and do that like 80% of the time, 60, 70% of the time, and then of course you still have that making love deep in the eyes, tantra kind of sex. But sometimes those girls just want some old-fashioned fucking. And they want it actually more often than not. And I mean, if there's no better evidence of this than Fifty Shades of Grey, I mean, to be able to dominate, not just physically, but mentally, to submit, it's very powerful. Here's another example of this. 
This is an actual disorder. It used to be called hypoactive sexual desire disorder. It was, it's been recognized as a distinct sexual dis, uh, function disorder for already over 30 years. Um, the finally, uh, which company is this? I can't, I don't, I'm not sure, but Adley, Addy, Addy, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, is, is prescribed by the FDA, I mean is um, approved by the FDA as treatment for, the new term for it is female sexual arousal disorder. And this is basically where she ain't turned on no more. So if she's not turned on anymore, you can take her to the doctor. This is a real, pro this is a real disorder. We can treat this. Your pussy ain't wet, you don't want to have sex, don't worry. We go to meet the doctor. <laughs> All right? And the doctor, this is, the, the dangerous part about this is the side effect is uh, unconsciousness. <laughs> like, I want to get turned on. Right? Okay, very bad. Right? So it's not very popular yet. Uh, I think more guys are trying to get it than women. But the trials for all the different variations of this, so before this one came out, there was another drug that was really popular being tested. The FDA, FDA has not approved that yet, but there was a two drugs together that they used. And there were lists of hundreds of thousands of women waiting to be tested on this. They wanted to get it back. Why? Because they have storge and philia with their husband. And maybe even uh, agape with their husband, but they don't have eros. So they are in this relationship and they have kids and they want, the woman wants the relationship to work, but she just doesn't want to have sex with him and she feels guilty about it. Every Friday night, sex night, he walks up the stairs, creak, creak, and she's like, oh fuck, it's sex night. Uh, how fast can I get this over? And so she just lies there like a fish. So are we done yet? Can you just come, hurry up? Okay, we're done. Okay, great, let's go watch some movies. Now let's go watch Netflix, you know, and chill. And these women feel really bad about this. She, they see the, the dissatisfaction in her husband, who she loves like a brother. So they go and they, they want to get turned on again. They want to rediscover. They think there's something wrong with themselves, which in a way there is. So um, I'm going to skip how this drug works. But the foremost expert in FSAD is Marta Miana at UNLV. And she does group and individual therapy. She's been doing this for decades. And she has found that the greatest predictor of FSAD the greatest correlation is relationship duration. Okay, so is that bubble burst yet? Has that, have you, has the pussy come off the pedestal yet? The longer you're in that relationship, the greater the chances she won't be turned on by you no more. She'll have to use the drug that makes her unconscious. <laughs> All right, and she has found that actually in group and individual therapy, the best, the most reliable cure for FSAD is the introduction of novelty. Or, in other words, other dudes. <laughs> so you take him to a swing, take her to a swingers group, and woohoo! She's having the time of her life. She wants to fuck, she wants to do it all kinds of ways. And he's like, oh shit. Isn't this interesting? You don't even need the drug. The drug, uh, you don't need the drug. You just take her and let her fuck some other dudes. How do we know that this is true? How can you know? Because you're that way. Come on, man. I don't, I don't care how long you've been in a relationship. I'll take you to the right places, you know, and I'll say, I buy this one for you. And you'll be very, t when I turn around, you ain't there no more. You'll be, oh, where'd he go? You want some. And I know one of the greatest fears of men who have some game is that I gotta fuck the same pussy my whole life? <laughs> what? You know, you can fuck the, the same pussy like 90% of the time. Come on, maybe on my birthday, let me fuck some strange. You know, maybe a few times a year, let me go, go to Jakarta or some shit. Like, come on, man, just let me, let me have some Vegas time for my, myself, you know, go out and, you know. You, you are like that. And you can get it going again, because sometimes the sex gets perfunctory, because you've been doing it the same way as the same woman for 50 years. Well, actually, in your case, not 50, but, you know, whatever, five years, and it's old. And you were, just the fact that it's new, she, that, that girl you're fucking may not be as hot as your wife. In fact, what I've noticed is, because I, I have a lot of friends who are married, and when they go out and do some strange, they end up picking girls who look like their wives. It's like, dude, what are you doing, man? You have this at home! <laughs> but it's just new. He loves his wife. It's just his dick is responding to the new. And there's something about, even in sales and marketing, when you say it's new, we want it. Like the iPhone. <laughs> you know, what's different about it? Who cares? It's new! It's a new one! All right, so women are the same way. And um, the dangerous thing is, what happened is, women will feel this quicker. Why? Because 
It's harder for a 45, 50, 60 year old man to get back in the dating scene and make it happen. He's gonna have to pay. If he's been, if he hasn't been, if he's not a social guy, if he hasn't been working on his masculinity and his polarity, uh, he, for him to enter a social scene at 50 years old and try to pick up some chicks, take home and fuck, it's gonna be hard. But the sad thing is, even an old lady, if she has a makeover, you know, get some Botox and shit, looks, you know, she dresses the right way and she's doing yoga and stuff, you throw her into a dark bar and she's like, hey, who wants to have sex? There's, man, dudes will line up. Free sex? They'll do it. They're like, how far do we have to go? The bathroom's okay? Yeah. They'll do it. That's the sad truth. Right now, the mating world is still skewed very much toward the woman. That's why one up versus one down. As a relationship goes on, the woman will be in the one up position because she's like, she feels guilty and feels pity for the man. Because she ain't feeling it sexually for him and she loves him like a brother uh, and they're partners in raising their kids. But man, there's no passion, there's no eros, there's no fucking desire. And in the meanwhile, this is, so this is the girl on the bottom, it should be the opposite, or there's two girls actually. <laughs> okay. So in the meanwhile, the dude's on the bottom and he's like, how do I make her turn on? How do I, and then I know because there's so many of these guys write to me, how do I turn on my woman? How do I do it? And they're in the one down. And the one down is, is a lot more helpless. The one up, if the one up is like, if she is magnanimous, generous, in, has integrity and compassion, she will help the one down and be able to re, to write that seesaw. They will go to the doctor together and she will say, I really feel bad. I wanna uh, have her sex life get uh, rekindled with passion again. What can we do? And she'll be a partner with that, but most women will not. Especially any woman that a red pill guy enters a relationship with, why? Because in that relationship, and I didn't get to go into this, but I did for you guys yesterday, the three levels of love. Red pill guys, manosphere guys, they're getting into relationships with women looking out for number one. And they expect her to look out for herself. Okay, and when they do that, as soon as this goes off balance, it's game over. The person at the top is not gonna help the person at the bottom. Relationship is over. So there are two paths I've been telling you about. The dark side, the reality, the science of long-term relationships, the science of female arousal. There are two paths. The one that everybody wants, whether man or woman, at some point in your life you wanted this. It was a fantasy that you believed in. When you're young, you want to do everything together. When you're older, you want to go everywhere together. And uh, when, you're, when you've been everywhere and done everything, all that really matters is that you're together and it's an old couple walking in the park together, holding hands. You want this. And the red pill, Manosphere, MDGTOW said, this is a myth, this isn't true. And I don't know about this, this is kind of, I don't know about this, but, but to go from here to here, you might have seen it if you think about it. Maybe your grandparents are still in love, maybe your parents. It's possible, but it's very, it's getting increasingly difficult. And the more you hold on to the troubadour myth, the more you will not experience this and not see people who do this and the divorce rate will just continue to rise because back in the day, people who weren't experiencing this, they pretended like they were and they just led life of quiet desperation. But now it's easy to get a divorce, everyone does. So it's more of like, which divorce are you on, right? So they'll just break it off. As, as soon as it gets really hard, when the seesaw gets unhinged or I mean uh, out of whack, they just give up. Yeah, it's too hard. Let's just start over with a new group, with a new couple, new partners. Now, in my old presentation that I, I was doing last year, um, I get ended with this, no love without freedom. And this is um, what the more enlightened ex-POAs are doing, which is like open relationships, where and a great example of this um, that I used to teach a whole other course on uh, is actually inspired by Reid Hoffman's book, a uh, LinkedIn founder on hiring. I forget the name of the book now, but it was about um, the fact that now our, our economy is different. We don't, it wasn't like in the 80s where you, like in, or like what Japan used to think it was. You, you started with the company after school, you stay with that company until you retire. Now people are jumping from job to job to company to company, and to, to, to have the illusion that that person you hire is gonna be with you forever until they retire is really naive. So let's prepare for the fact that you're gonna leave in three to five years. And let's make that explicit. What can we do under those conditions and how can we make you happy knowing that? And then we can renew at every point. Uh, on both sides, you can stay with us uh, or we can continue to have you. And in that sense, there's freedom. We know how hard it will get in the future. And um, I think that's a very enlightened perspective. 
Another great one is if you Google Gwyneth Paltrow's recent, uh, well, relatively recent divorce, and it was a very enlightened separation, and they put out a statement about it, about the therapist's view of, of, uh, of marriage and divorce. And this, is, this, could, this could work. Um, it's a pretty new arrangement. But what you give up on is this dream. And I, I've been studying the couples that have actually lived this. Uh, so we have lifespan, pro we have life expectancy issues. We, that, you know, we didn't have to deal with this before. Um, now we do. We could live till 95, 100. Some of us in this room could live old, over 100. How do you have a relationship that starts at 30 and goes to, for 70 years and keep it strong? So I've been studying that for many years. And there is a radical solution. And they're based on two principles. Based on two principles. This is polarity. I'm showing plus minus here. Polarity. Over time, you become who you spend time with. And if you're, you're going to spend the most time ever with your life partner, you will both depolarize. You'll become more feminist, you'll become more masculine. That's assuming you were masculine to begin with. <laughs> All right, but you'll, be, you'll be basically become like each other. And that's part of the reason why this, the Eros disappears. It, may not, it is not a biological impossibility. <coughs> Novelty is something you need to navigate. But it, uh, just the fact that you still have the machinery, and so does she. Right? There's, no, there's no biological impossibility about that. Um, but it is difficult to maintain the polarity over time. And the other thing you need to bring is your presence. Over time, you take each other for granted. Over time, uh, you have discussions where you're looking off into the distance to, t to both of you together are doing something together as partners. That's what buddies do, right? Male to male friends, they sit there and fish together. There's always an activity. They make it about the activity and they do it together. They go shooting together, they go hunting, you know, whatever. Something they're, they're never, fa like, to face to face with your dude friend to do something is awkward, <laughs> you know, unless you're fighting. <laughs> but you do something, you watch a movie together, you have drinks together, you do something together. Women aren't like that. Women, they sit across from each other, you know, and they, they talk, they get in there, they're present. The woman wants presence. The man's natural thing is to, okay, I got her now, I don't have to be present no more. Let's be partnerships. A partnership is going to kill the, the uh, arousal. Bring your presence. Bring a presence. So I cover this in rock solid relationships. Uh, we're in pilot program for that at the moment. Um, when that launches, you may hear about it. But the only way you will hear about it is if you join the private Man Up Facebook group. Join that group right now. We approve requests daily, uh, and uh, you get a lot of free courses. So I've mentioned a bunch of them in there. Is she relationship material to screen and select the right person to invest in? Uh, we also cover how to get out of the friend zone if you find yourself on the friend zone couch. Um, and we also go into um, how to make a relationship passionate. It's a crash course in it, but it also serves as a preview into a much more uh, detailed uh, uh, examination and training in passion and polarity and presence. So I leave you with this, my friends. It is possible. It is a radical solution. It is something that actually requires some training and understanding, but it's actually quite simple. It's very simple, but not easy. It's simple, but it requires practice and it requires application. Um, but it is very simple. So I leave you with that. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you all the guys in this room. We are now going to continue with the rest of our program here. Um, and I'll, we'll, we'll end the video here for now. Join the private Facebook group and I'll see you inside there. David Tien, signing out. <laughs>